one thing that I've always really focused on is acting upon what I talk about. And and I think, you know, this industry is pretty small. Your reputation's important. But, you know, if Mm -hmm. you say something, let's make it happen or die trying. You know what I mean? There's a lot of good discussion at the moment across the industry covering a number of important areas, but we need to make it happen. And it takes action and it takes collaborative, collective efforts through the tertiary education institutions like the vet schools, the uh, sort of industry organizations, state board level, private and public sector, um, everyone working together to try and uh, address these issues. And they can be addressed. Like these are things we can get through. Other organizations have got through them, uh, other industries rather, have got through them previously um, and are in better positions. Yeah, we've got to have some tough conversations and we've got to, we've got to call out some things that are contributing to, to what's going, going wrong. That is Dr. Andrew Moffat. And this is the Venn Foundation's Veterinary Pulse podcast. I'm Jordan Benshia, Executive Director of the Vin Foundation. Join me and our co-host and Vin Foundation board member, Dr. Matt Holland, as we talk with veterinary colleagues about critical topics and share stories. Stories that connect us as humans, as animals, as a veterinary community. This podcast is made possible by individuals like you who donate to the VIN Foundation. Thank you. Please check the episode notes for bios, links, and information mentioned. Welcome, Andrew. Thank you for joining us. We're thrilled to have you here. Oh, my pleasure, Jordan. I feel really honored to be a part of it. Well, I'm honored that you were willing to be a guest for us. You're doing so many amazing things in the veterinary profession, and I'm really excited to let our audience hear a little bit about your story and your path. And let's just, um, you know, dive right in. Share with us your veterinary path. Did you always want to be a veterinarian? How did you get to the veterinary profession? Well, yeah, I was one of uh, um, one of those uh, um, children who um, decided really early on that they wanted to be a vet. My mum tells a story of me as a five year old, sort of asking her what that person was on TV, and she told me it was an animal doctor, and and I um, told her then and there that I wanted to be a veterinarian. So. It's always been a bit of a calling for me. Um, right. And um, I, I just, look, I feel incredibly lucky being a veterinarian is a true gift. It's really my purpose. And I just, I pinch myself every day. I feel like the luckiest guy in the world to be to be uh, working as a, as, as a veterinarian. So, yeah, I mean, it was it was just done and dusted. I never had a plan B. There was no, what if I don't get in? It was just right. uh, going to happen. And um, fortunately, um, you know, I turned up to enough classes to, and scrape, scraped in and, and then continue to scrape through. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's not a lot of people that you hear had a plan initially from childhood and that worked out. So applaud you for that for sure. <laughs> <laughs> And obviously, our, our listeners are probably hearing that you have an awesome accent. So why don't you give us a little insight into where you're from and how you you are now in the U.S. and how did that journey happen? Yeah, so it's a, um, it's a, it's it's an interesting journey. Uh, I, I'm from Melbourne, Australia. Um, I left in in 2005 and started my veterinary degree at University of Melbourne in uh, 2000, uh, 2001 rather. Um, and uh, back then um, you could get into veterinary school straight out of school. So I sort of was in veterinary school as a 19 year old. Um, in fact, I was uh, you know, still 18, I think at the time, which is a bit crazy. Um, uh, completely unprepared from a maturity standpoint to tackle the, the rigorous <laughs> nature of veterinary school, but that was the way it was back then. And um, so I, I started uh, vet school at Melbourne and, and uh, um, it was a great school. Um, it really enjoyed my, my time there. But in my final year, 
which was going to be 2005, we got informed that um, University of Melbourne was going to miss out on AVMA accreditation that year. And I didn't know oh, I no. wanted to work in the States. <laughs> yeah. And, and then if you don't graduate with it, like you, you don't get it and you've got to go through um, some some other paths to be licensed in America. And those other paths, um, such as PAVE and so forth, are, 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 are really challenging. Um, and at the time, I didn't know I wanted to practice in the States, but I just wanted the option to practice everywhere in the world. And, and for whatever reason, it seemed important to me. So I'd actually just been to... Uh, um, the, there's an Austra Australasian students conference that's really just an excuse for a big party. And um, <laughs> it was held at Massey University in, uh, um, in, on the, in the summer holidays in New Zealand yep, yeah. in 2005, yeah. uh, January. And I went and so met all the guys at Massey. And uh, Norm Williamson was, I think, uh, the year coordinator then. And Norm actually, I think, went to Melbourne University. And I emailed Norm Massey was already accredited and, and um, uh, you know, has been accredited for a long time. And so I emailed Norm and said, Norm, look, I, I would like to graduate from an accredited program. You know, um, you know would New Zealand uh, consider me transferring vet schools? Um, and I'm actually a half breed. My mum's a New Zealander. Um, and, <laughs> and so that helped a little bit with the student loan piece. But um, Massey agreed. Um, but they obviously wouldn't give me the degree with just six months to go. They asked me to sort of stay down and, and, and uh, um, uh, you know, stay down a year so I could, um, you know, complete a, a significant portion of the program. And so I, um, yeah, transferred to Massey um, and then actually graduated the end of 2006 from Massey University with American accreditation. Um, so you end up, went, end up going five years instead of four. It, uh, it, well, the, it, at that time in Australasia, it was like a five-year program. So I actually ended up doing oh, okay. six years. Six. Um, yeah, okay. And right. so I think I was done and dusted and, and practicing as a, uh, uh, you know, as a 24-year-old. Um, just ridiculous. You know, I couldn't even tie my wow. shoelaces and I was set loose <laughs> on, the, on the world. But Massey was important for a couple of reasons because when I left Melbourne, I was obsessed with aquaculture. I wanted to be the next uh, um, Paul Hardy Smith and I wanted to be a fish veterinarian. My favourite lecturer at Melbourne was Paul <laughs> Hardy, Dr. Paul Hardy Smith, who was, a, who was uh, like an incredible fish vet and big into aquaculture. And um, yeah, that's what I wanted to be. And I was already looking to get into the, uh, f the aquaculture specialty program in Stirling, Scotland when I left Melbourne. And when I went to New Zealand, I just completely uh, fell in love again with clinical practice. I had some outstanding um, clinical mentors there in, in, uh, in, in small animal practice and on the farm side. And, and um, I just realized that as much as I love animals, I love people and, and, um, you know, sitting, uh, on a fish farm in the, you know, in, in the, uh, fjordlands of British Columbia, there weren't going to be a lot of people in my life. And I realized that clinical practice, uh, may be the right path for me. And so I pivoted completely. And when I graduated, went into mixed animal practice. Um, and Massey also got me started on my world adventure. So um, Banfield actually um, helped me um, with, with uh, um, d you know, so fulfilling my dream of practicing in America and supported me with some of my um, my Navli and my California boards initially. Um, but, but I didn't go straight to America. I actually went to England as a new graduate and joined an amazing James Harriet style mixed practice about an hour south of London. In in, uh, in a town called Lewis um, in Sussex. Wow! So before you're even thirty, you've done Australia, Massey, and then the UK. Yeah. Yep. And <laughs> and uh, yeah, I was in the U in the UK for five years. Uh, went to business school and got to the US. Uh, I think when I was uh, twenty eight or twenty nine, and yeah, had like four or five years under my belt. Wow. Uh, yeah, and I was ready to ready to take on. <laughs> take on America. Yeah. <laughs> That's incredible. So, okay. You're, you know, you come to America and you're, what age are you at that point? Did you say 29? I think I was, uh, I think I was 20. I got here in 2011. Oh my God. So. Sub 30. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So 28, 29, you've had all this experience already under your belt. Where do you start when you get to the U.S.? 
Well, yeah, like I was um, – so the US, my American dream was very close to not happening. So when I was uh, – I got a little bit disenchanted with veterinary practice in, in the UK um, um, for, you know, a lot of the same challenges that face veterinarians in America. Um, but over there, the level of remuneration is considerably less and you're on a salary. So even if you practice at a higher level, you can't really improve your um, remuneration. Um, and, um, you know, I was uh, at that time, I think, uh, managing uh, four sites for a larger corporate group, about, I think, about 60 staff total. We had MRI on site, an American radiologist diplomat, two European diplomats and uh, four different sites. And I think uh, wow. I was working 80 hour weeks and paid perhaps maybe 70,000 US dollars. And, oh my um, gosh! Yeah, yeah. My sort of relationship was was on the cusp of falling apart, and I was doing nothing in my life except working. And you know, it was a purpose for me. I love veterinary work, but I now know that you've got to invest in other things in your life. And so, at business school, I actually got in contact with some human hospitals, and um, I was very close to uh, taking a role as an administrator in a human hospital. I'd given up on my ownership dream. I'd tried to buy a few practices in the UK. And um, at that time, the corporate consolidation of veterinary hospitals was, was um, probably 10 years ahead of the US and probably more similar to where it is now over here. And so I just couldn't get my foot in the door. And, and uh, so I'd sort of given up the dream on practice ownership and was about to take a job uh, in, in a human hospital as an administrator when I got a phone call. And I got a call from a mate of mine from Massey, a guy called Jerob Leeper. And um, Jerob was a few years below me, but um, had graduated from Massey and came straight to Northern California and started work in a hospital that was owned by his great uncle, a guy called Russ Hackler. And um, I think Jerob, you know, on Facebook back then, we didn't have Instagram and all Twitter or whatever you right, call right. it. We were just on Facebook. Um, and uh, I think Jerob got the sense that I was getting itchy feet and he reached out and said something along the lines of, hey, Andrew, want to buy my great uncle's practice, but I don't know how to run a practice. Wow. And he said, do you want to come and do it? And I think I thought about it for about 10 seconds and I thought this is, <laughs> this is, this is my chance to, to be a practice owner and, and see if I can make a go of it. And so wow. uh, my girlfriend at the time and I got sort of a one-way one way ticket to America. And uh, we came for a month to check it out. And uh, um, I was terrified of coming to the Ameri uh, America just because, you know, at vet school, you hear about Davis and Cornell. And and, and I was thinking, <laughs> gee, you know, am I going to cut the mustard? You know what I mean? Like, um, I, I might not be good enough. And, and um, I came with a lot of good skills and interviewed at maybe six or seven hospitals in the Bay Area, and no one would offer me a job. And uh, um, I was, you know, thinking about what it would be. I was going, you know, the accent's pretty good and I've got some clinical <laughs> skills. What's, what's, what's going on? Um, and I think it was just the reality that I actually needed some visa sponsorship. So, like, as an Australian citizen, there's a great visa, but I still needed someone to sort of activate it with a job offer. And at that time, uh, there wasn't yeah. a, a vet shortage in the Bay Area. You know, there would be six or seven candidates for each position. And I just think these smaller hospitals thought I was a bit too much hard work with a visa and, and um, offer the jobs to US citizens, understandably. So, we, we came for four weeks to sort of test it out and I couldn't get a job. And with three days to go... I said to Jared, mate, I'm going to have to go back to the UK. I can't activate my visa. No one will give me a job. And uh, Jared uh, rang Russ Hackler and <laughs> Russ didn't need a vet at the time, but I think Russ felt a bit sorry for me. And um, and we we only came with a thousand dollars. Like we we you know we, we oh my gosh. We, didn't, we didn't have much much money. I think um, you know we'd just been travelling through Europe for a few months before we came out here, and I think we'd spend everything we had. Um, <laughs> and um, and and so overnight, Russ offered me a job and gave me another thousand dollars. And so with that two thousand dollars, we were able to put a deposit down for an apartment. And and then Russ gave me a job three days before we were going back, and and that was that was my sliding door moment. Oh my gosh! Yeah, those yeah sliding door moments, right? That's <laughs> life comes down to those. It really, like within three days. I mean, I can imagine you guys are just at the limit and just thinking there. Oh my gosh! Okay, this could be the end. But 
Gosh, what a great story and and how your connections and just knowing friends helped with that and with, with the last minute to be able to get you into the U.S. for your dream. And so, OK, so now you're you have your visa sponsored. And yeah. did he hire you also as a veterinarian or did he just like find a way to sponsor you? He, no, he he hired me as a veterinarian, and uh, um, you know it was my and 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 this is the um, ended up being the first practice that that we bought. So Jerob and I bought this phenomenal practice about three months later. Okay, wow. Yeah, Groveway Veterinary Hospital is where my American dream started, and where the whole concept of of vet and care sort of sort of began. A little practice in Hayward, California, the last place you'd necessarily start a practice uh, if you looked at all the socioeconomics. But um, that community uh, has done so much to support me and and that hospital. And um, yeah, feel really proud to be a part of the Castro Valley Hayward Chamber of Commerce and and uh, and. Yeah, that, that community means a lot to me, really gave me my start over here. That's an incredible story. And <laughs> all right, so you've bought this practice after three months of being here. And, yeah. you know, how does that form into vet and care? How do you get from that to where you are today? I mean, you, you're doing really well. You, you are implementing you know, based on my conversation with, you know, some of your staff, uh, really amazing practices from an employment perspective, from a human perspective, um, that I think a lot of businesses don't irrelevant to the industry. And, and so I'd love to hear how you how you go from that to where you are today. Yeah, so I, I think, um, you know, a lot of people ask me this question, and I would love to be able to say, gee, I had a, this big plan. And, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, we did all these demographic studies, and Hayward was the perfect spot. And I just knew that America needed a bit of a change up on the, but I mean, that's, that would all be a lie. <laughs> um, like, literally on the plane over here, I was writing ideas on on the back of an envelope and and uh, look I, I had been a part of some fantastic veterinary groups in the UK mm -hmm. and and mm -hmm. British practice was really the standard in the world at the time and uh, um, I, I've still got some people that I hold in high regard there my mentor Jane Bell Main is currently the chief operations officer of, of the vet group who who um, uh, um, uh, you, you know run the the business which is uh, Vets for Pets and, and so forth. Um, and she's a tremendous supporter of mine. Brendan Robinson, who uh, ran Village Vets uh, group and uh, is still active in the vet industry, was an inspiration to, to me and my sister, who, who's a veterinarian who works over here with me at the moment. So I think a lot of my experiences there um, gave me a vision of, of what we wanted to be. And, and mm -hmm. you know, our, our style of practice is much more similar to sort of, I suppose, you know, um, uh, British general practice and is standard in, in the US. But like just the concept of coming over with a like um, a cookie, cookie cutter approach and just implementing what I'd learned was just uh, would have been foolish. And in fact, uh, it, you know, early on as a young owner, uh, you know, I made lots of mistakes. I, I came in with too much hubris and, and, and at Groveway particularly made heaps of mistakes. Um, I changed mm -hmm. things too quickly. I, I didn't listen or ask good questions to the, to the previous employees. I didn't, I didn't, I, I should have done a much better job at really, you know, partnering and listening to Dr. Russ Hackler, who was just like an incredible man and, 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 his insights and observations would have allowed me to do a much better job. But, you know, I came in as a young guy thinking I knew what I was doing. And, and you know, we had big loans to, to buy that clinic. And so, you know, we wanted it to perform uh, quickly so that we could show the bank that we knew what we were doing. And as much as Groveway has become a tremendous success over the last decade, um, you know, it was a real learning ground for me. And I think um, we, we, with that first practice, we had a lot of um, uh, great challenges that, that really, um, t you know, taught me a lot about myself and, and managing practices and, and, and sort of navigating and supporting teams through acquisition. Um, and we also went through a lot of hardship. So, um, you know, devastatingly, six months after I bought that practice, Dr. Russ Hackler died in a plane crash. Oh, um, my gosh. 
and yeah. um, and and Russ was someone who um, I just held in high regard and was such an important part of that community, and someone who, um, y- you know, I I had hoped was going to give me so much mentorship and coaching uh, in the years to come, and he and he gave me right. so much. He's really the reason I'm in this country, um, but to um, you know not see him have have the incredible retirement that he deserved, and for him not to have seen um, how great the hospitals become um, was was incredibly incredibly sad um, uh, and absolutely. so yeah a lot, lot of what we're doing you know is is right. in, is in his name and his late wife Kathy Hackler was an incredible supporter of mine and gave me great mentorship as sort of I navigated those those early days so yeah in that first practice there were certainly nights and days where um, you know we were thinking hey it's all over um, we're, we're not going to make this um, and, right. and um, I, I think the amount of time and energy we put into that first practice um, you know and I have a lot of energy I, I'd been managing hospitals at a high level in, in the UK I had an MBA I had a good team around me I had a great mm-hmm. partner in Jerob and, and, and our uh, um, respective partners um, mm-hmm. and it was still incredibly tough you know like mm-hmm. like um, uh, breakingly tough and and right, uh, right. we just sort of scraped through and so you can sort of understand why practice ownership isn't super desirable for a lot of um, you know, younger <laughs> veterinarians who don't have all the, um, you know, experiences I, I have. And I think, um, however, finally got to a point where, um, you know, ownership is not only a lot of fun, incredibly rewarding, financially rewarding uh, also, which I think is something that, that um, I'm passionate about talking to young vets about. Um, but like if we could get to that point without that crazy hardship that I had to go through and many other practice owners, owners have to right. go through, then that sort of, I think that's what inspired the whole whole dream. You know, we sort of, once we mm-hmm. got Grove Way going in the right direction, we realised, well, I realised having managed multiple hospitals in the UK that we could, you know, perhaps replicate this. And mm-hmm. um and so, you know, our second hospital uh, was our so first real partnership with Dr. Emily Lin. Um, uh, and Emily, I don't know what, what Emily saw in me, um, but like <laughs> after, um, you know, just a few discussions, Emily and I hit it off and she, 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 she put, put hung hung her hat on on sort of the dream we were I, I sort of um, illustrated to her, and Emily's been an incredible partner of mine through the last decade, and now runs an incredibly sex, successful hospital, and and has been through a lot of that journey uh, w- with me. And so you know, each each time we got through another practice, and and saw um, each one um, performing better, and us being able to go through the sort of transition of acquisition better we realize mm-hmm. that we're onto something and and um, you know the model that we embrace in the UK is called a joint venture partnership model and um, I came out here intending to sort of realize that model here and slowly but surely we realized that um, this might just change the industry um, in terms of giving you know um, um, aspiring veterinarians who really want more out of veterinary than just a nine to five the opportunity mm-hmm. to um, you know, um, obtain the professional and financial satisfaction that I've got out of this career, and and that's that's where we are today. Wow, yeah, you know, when you first shared about just the time and you know mistakes that, in hindsight, you've recognized, that's where so much learning happens, right? And being willing to recognize that we made those mistakes and that we learned from them, right? I mean, we don't learn things by doing things right. You know, I mean, we, we learn very little, right? <laughs> exactly. And I think like we've got a bit of a unsaid mantra in our organization that you can't learn without mistakes. And 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 that right. applies to clinical mentorship um, mm-hmm. uh, and, and, and also, um, you know, ownership. And so, you know, all the partners now join our organization get the luxury where they've got they're part of a community of other veterinary leaders and owners who have been through their own experience within our within our sort of uh, community, um, and we all mm-hmm. learn together. So um, you know, 
Jerob was able to make less mistakes than I had done. Emily, less mistakes right. than Jerob and I made. <laughs> Dr. Yeah. Max Salinas, less mistakes than Emily and I had made. And, and our, our, current, our current partners come in and, and really primarily are playing a sort of clinical or medical director role, focusing 95% of their attention on their patients, on their teammates, on clients to really mm-hmm. try and, um, you know, realize these fantastic clinical cultures that I think are pretty rare in America. Um, and everything else, we sort of take off their plate so they can be their press professional selves. So, you know, if we compare traditional practice ownership to our version of it, it's actually something that can be really well managed by competent individuals so that they can realize their um, their professional legacy in being an owner. They can realize their aspirations to advance clinically and practice at a higher level. They can mm-hmm. be a voice in their clinics and, and, mm-hmm. and be a leader and a mentor. Um, they get the financial security of, of that position. But they can also have, and I don't like work-life balance. I think one of your podcasts talked about work-life symbiosis. Um, uh-huh. <laughs> they they can realise that concept because you know because they can be their best self professionally, and they are also in a far stronger financial position. They can then have better personal lives, and 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 I think that's right. that's what the industry has to has to embrace. You can't be great personally if you're in a financial hellhole because you've come out of debt school with four hundred thousand dollars of debt and and you you haven't attended all tony bartell's seminars and and <laughs> you, you've, you've got right. no financial education at vet school and and you've got no mentor to talk to you about ownership and inspire you to be mm-hmm. consider practice ownership um so um you know i think yeah i mean that's that's sort of all I live for these days is is helping veterinarians, um, you know, be their best professional selves, and and in our model that embraces, um, you know, uh, l- clinical leadership, clinical culture, patient care, um, and a lot of that it goes alongside, you know, veterinarians advancing clinically far beyond what's sort of normal in America. Um, mm-hmm. and, and then with that comes, uh, you know, the financial security that never drives a veterinarian. But, gee, it's a lot easier to be right. a great veterinarian right. if you don't have to worry about your financial stresses. Um, well, we and, definitely yeah. see that. Yeah. I mean, we see the the student that challenges that people have and the immediate tie to the mental health challenges and vice versa. Right. And exactly. you definitely see it in the veterinary profession. I think it's it's you know rational to see that across the board in all industries mm, mm, um mm. and and specifically in the veterinary profession based on the student to debt ratio that people are coming out of veterinary school with and and you combine that with the challenges like you said in the beginning that you realize you really like people I think we can agree that's very rare for most veterinarians to really like people, right? They tend to prefer animals. And and a lot of people get into the veterinary profession thinking that they're going to be dealing with animals a lot, but really you're dealing with people. And <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So you're you a rarity out myth, of the gate. One. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I'm a bit of a weirdo. I'm, I'm, I'm cool with that. And I think most people in the industry know I'm a little bit of an outlier. But, you know, I mean, that's, that's cool. It's nice to be different. And, uh, and, um, and, and, you know, I, I think this industry historically has been pretty stale, you know, with its, with its um, views and, and, and mm-hmm. values. And I think, um, you know, I, th- I think, I mean, to touch on some of the challenges in the industry today, I mean, th- what we're doing right now isn't working. Uh, and if, if it was working, we wouldn't have the highest suicide rate in, in, of all professions. We wouldn't have an epidemic right. of, of mental health crisis. We wouldn't have consistently um, uh, like anxiety around financial security amongst veterinarians. Um, there's so much that's not working in our industry. And, and mm-hmm. it's just not, it, it, it can't, it's not an easy fix. You know what I mean? Like, right, um, right. you know, a couple of compassion fatigue webinars ain't going to do it. Um, um, mm-hmm. y- you know, the AVMA trying to s- make a statement on inclusion diversity ain't going to cut it. Y- you know, we, we simply mm-hmm. need action and, mm-hmm. um, and, and representation and, and pretty significant change and at all levels. 
levels. Right. And and I think this is why this podcast is so great because it really encourages um, uh, discussion and collaboration of 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 a, of a really wide nature. And, and that it encourages good thought and hopefully change. But I've, I've never been, um, you know, you, you don't want to be full of hot air. Like I, I think like one thing that I've always really focused on is acting upon what I talk about. And, and I think, right. you know, this industry is pretty small. Your reputation's important. But, you know, if mm-hmm. you say something, let's make it happen or die trying. You know what I mean? And, and, uh, um, and, and, and I think, it, it's uh, there's a lot of good discussion at the moment across the industry covering a number of important areas, but we need to make it happen. And it takes action and it takes uh, uh, collaborative, collective efforts uh, um, through the tertiary in- institu- education institutions like the vet schools, um, uh, the, the uh, sort of industry organisations, state board level, um, private and public sector um, you know, everyone working together to try and uh, address these issues, and 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 they can be addressed. Like these are things we can get through. Other organisations have got through them. Uh, other industries, rather, have got through them previously, um, and are in better positions. Um, but um, yeah, we've got to have some tough conversations, and we've got to we've got to call out some things that are contributing to to what's going going wrong. And that's when you know people get a bit sweaty under the collar. But like if we if we focus on what we're here to do. Which is yeah. to um, allow our veterinarians to be their best professional selves, knowing that the the those veterinarians will provide uh, a higher level of patient and client care. You know, and, right, and that's right. where my my journey's gone. You know, I grew up loving animals, and then mm-hmm. I I, uh, I sort of changed my course of vet school, realizing I really like clients and and the outcomes I could help them towards. But you know, now my mm-hmm. sole focus pretty much is is veterinarians and and technical teams, knowing that if I can help them be their best selves, the patients and clients get looked after automatically you know you know what i mean right um and and i think that's where um you know the vin foundation and others do great great jobs but you know to to allow a veterinarian to be their best selves um through the entirety of a career takes a a number of different initiatives um you know uh, uh, the key uh, as a new graduate that first year in practice if you don't have Mm -hmm. a great mentor Mm -hmm. that can really inspire you forward it strongly correlates with you either dropping out of of that profession or not enjoying it. You get that first year to make or break it, in my opinion, and I, I think that's why I'm so passionate about mentorship. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, there's um, certainly some pressing issues in our industry. Yes, um, there that are, are. That yeah, are, that are in- interesting. Yeah, there definitely are, and there's a few things that you said that I want to touch on. One is. Um, you know, I think that there's a lot of people out there, organizations out there that want to just check a box, right? As it relates to a lot of different topics. And I have said on this podcast many times that we are not here to check a box where we really want to have meaningful conversations and really dive deep to find out what are the issues and what's causing the issues. How can we have these deep conversations to help learn from each other, how we can improve, you know, the profession and, And we, you know, so much that you said, like the first for new grads, it's so vital. Like our confidential support group, Vets for Vets, found that if new grads were thriving in their first five years out of veterinary school, then they were thriving throughout their careers, right? And if they were struggling this first, right. And if they're struggling in those first five years, I know you said first year, fair enough. Yeah. Then they were in general, right? And so like our Thrive in Five toolkit that we kind of put together as a um, new grad sort of combination of resources there to try and help them. And we're always looking for ways to improve that. And even just in talking today, I'm thinking of some ways that we can improve that toolkit. But that's the vital time is how do we help to get the word out of resources that are helpful, some that the foundation has, some that other has, like, how can we all work together and collaborate? Because, you know, we as the VIN Foundation say that we believe a healthy animal community depends on a healthy veterinary community, you know, and I'm not a veterinarian, obviously. Yeah, but I love animals and I'm a big believer where it's like, I can't imagine a world with no animals or sick animals. So why wouldn't we want to just support our our veterinary colleagues and support the veterinary profession? And that's a no brainer for me. I realize that not all pet owners feel that way, <laughs> but but I do and very fervently. Um, and and it, and there is a lot of opportunity for us to improve um in in the profession and and 
one thing I'm kind of curious about is since you are running so many practices and you've got this experience, what are some tips that you would give practice owners as to how they can, you know, help their, their staff from a mental health perspective or student debt perspective, or if they see them struggling, what are some things that you've learned that work well? Yeah, so that, that's a good question. And I think like, um, uh, you know, I think some of the challenges we have in this country is the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the age of ownership in the US is quite a bit higher than Britain and Australia. Um, mm-hmm. So, um, you know, and an example, um, you know, and this is a complete generalization. Um, you, you know, many of the previous owners who have passed their legacies on to me are tremendous people who I'm still in contact with and have helped me greatly through my career. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, but I think, like, you know, mental health is a good example. Um, uh, um, you know, my dad, my dad was a dentist and he's a great man and someone I look up to uh, um, uh, really fondly. But my dad's generation, you know, um, didn't really understand or embrace mental health and, and mm-hmm. particularly mm-hmm. for like male men from Australia, the concept of being vulnerable and expressing your feelings and, and uh, uh, letting people know when you're struggling. You know, when I grew up, it was just not a thing that was that was done and so right. you know i think knowing that that is a priority and something important for younger professionals to to do as part of really getting to know themselves knowing their limits and having the confidence to have conversations around how they're feeling where they feel vulnerable I think younger grads can only do that if it's role modeled by mentors and other people in the profession. Right. Um, mm-hmm. I tell people widely, you know, I had a, a breakdown probably two and a half years ago. I've having listened to Dr. Susan Cohen's webinar, I've definitely got red shoe syndrome. Um, mm-hmm. and, and, and my work consumed me to everything else. And mm-hmm. it was sort of hard because it's my purpose. I actually like it. So it's, it's mm-hmm. easy to be consumed. But I reckon, you know, two and a half years ago when my life and my marriage fell apart, I realized that I was not investing in lots of other really important things in my life. Um, right. I had some addiction issues. Uh, I was comp- like burnt out, overworked, um, uh, and, and, and obsessed and consumed with, with, with the business. And it, it didn't make me my best self. Um, you know, I was cranky. I was short with people. I didn't take time to listen or mentor. Um, I, I, you know, my, my family and friends who were so important to my life, uh, you know, I wasn't making time for them. I wasn't, I'm an obsessed extreme sportsman and, and I wasn't exercising. I was eating, mm-hmm. drinking too much. Um, and, and sometimes until your life unravels, you don't really realize, you know, what, what's Very going true. wrong. So mm-hmm. for me, you know, the last two years for me, a lot of my spare time has been focusing on learning about myself and trying to grow as a human being, you know, knowing that, that if I can be a better, person myself I can be a better professional to my patients and clients I can be a better mentor Mm -hmm. and partner to my veterinarians and perhaps I can be a better you know influence to the industry but you know I do the silver lining of me having that challenging time is that I've sort of been through it and and I, I I sort of understand some of the challenges or many of the challenges put on veterinarians because I too have worked myself to the bone. I cared so much and I still do that, that uh, you, you know, my work can consume me. And so I think, you know, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about mindfulness. And I think, you know, that's something that, um, you know, business owners can uh, um, be more um, proactive with. You know, I think it's easy mm-hmm. for, um, you know, um, people of my dad's era to go, oh, you know, you know, that stuff doesn't matter and just get on with it. You know, see that patient right, or, right. you know, s- sink or swim. And, and you know, I was sort of, I had great mentorship, but there was a little bit of sink or swim and, 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 mm-hmm. and, and I kind of liked that. And that, that was fine for me, but, but we all know I'm a bit weird. And I think for the majority of people, um, you know, that, that is um, a bit, daunting and so knowing that like um you know that type of dialogue and and um you know mental health and mindfulness is an important 
value and focus for the younger generation of veterinarians. I think practice owners who are often in the financial position to uh, embrace time off, um, uh, mindfulness, mentorship, you know, these folks often have the financial position where they can take a bit more time off. They, you know, it's you've got to role model the right behaviors. So if I'm telling everybody, oh yeah, take a holiday, you know, make sure you get some time off and 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 I take one week off a year, then, right, then we've got right. a problem because yep. you know younger vets <laughs> follow their their role model. And so if I'm not embracing mental health, if I'm not taking time off, if I'm not working hard to mentor, if I'm not advancing clinically and taking CE, uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, like taking it seriously um if i'm not you know passing on my knowledge of of you know practice ownership to the younger gen and and you know actively trying to make our workplaces more diverse and inclusive um you, you know no one else will take it seriously and i think as an organization that's why we're kind of unique because we're owned and led by veterinarians who who know what it's like and so a lot mm-hmm. of our initiatives are uh, created and and implemented by veterinarians who are still in the trenches, and and uh, because of that, I, I think we're a little bit more connected, you know, compared mm-hmm. to organisations who are owned and operated by business people or people right. who haven't practiced in a long time. It's easy to get disconnected from mm-hmm. the challenges of, of the trenches, you know. Yeah, that's um, a few things that you talked about. So um, one, you mentioned vulnerability in the beginning, and. Gosh, that's like the mother load of stuff. You know, I mean, it's one of the reasons that I wanted to start this podcast because I'm a fervent believer that, you know, everyone's story is their differentiator and it's what makes us unique. And and only though through being vulnerable and being willing to open ourselves up, are we able to really connect? Right. I mean, somebody might be listening to this podcast and hearing everything until you just shared that part and might think, OK, well, he's got it all together. He never has any issues. Everything's great. He's been to all these different countries and, you know, and then you share something like that and about your experience and your willingness to be vulnerable there. And somebody's able to connect and say, wow, OK, so he's had challenges, too. Too, or he struggled with things too. And that's what really allows us to connect as people, colleagues. Um, and it's one of the like main reasons I wanted to start this podcast to share those stories and find ways to connect so that we can learn from each other. And so I, I really applaud you for doing that. Um, and then when you're talking about practice owners and just that ability of like, if you're not doing it yourself, others aren't going to do it. Got to role model it. Yeah. you Got to role model it. You know, yeah, there's a book yeah. that came out this um, year called by Rich Devinney. He's a retired uh, Navy SEAL commander. And he was saying in this book called The Attributes that, you know, you can't tell somebody that you're a leader. Right. You need to show you through your actions, you show that you're a leader and they can choose to follow you or not. Right. Yeah, exactly. You can't say to them, I'm your leader. Um, And I think that that is sort of in line with what you're talking about, um, that if you don't show by role modeling it and then, you know, it's all talk. Right. And I think that's something that you said in the beginning of the podcast was just about not just talking it, but actually walking the walk. Right. And I think that's so. A really yeah. Thing. You, you got to. And I think like, um, look, I'm, I'm still a work in progress. I've got heaps we of issues. Are. I think we all do. We and, all and, are. <laughs> and, and uh, but I look, I do think like I'm, I'm proud. I think like like today I would say that one of my my stronger attributes now is like awareness that, um, you know, I've got issues and just being a um, like trying to seek knowledge and coaching and mm-hmm. ideas on how I can be a better version of myself. Um, That's it. And, yeah. And, and, and you know, I, like we only get one body and we yep. only get one mind and you've got to take care of it. And ultimately, if you if you can't take care of yourself, you can't take care of others. And and uh, and, right. and you know, like but burnout, something I like, to, you know, touching on a bit. And and there's a lady called Christina Mullix, um mm-hmm. uh, or Maslax. I, I can't pronounce her last name, but <laughs> but I like her definition. She's got a cool YouTube video, video, and just breaks down some of the aspects of of burnout and and how it works. And and I like that concept. You know, I think that would be a great you know way for the profession to start. If you look at her breakdown of burnout, which in imbr- like touches on lack of control, uh, value mm-hmm. conflicts, insufficient reward, work overload, unfairness, and community breakdown. If we dr- mm-hmm. just as a profession address like those six things, 
that'll be a great start. Knowing that right. burnout is a combination of all six of those, even if we fix three of them, we're going to dramatically reduce burnout <laughs> and allow people exactly. to, to enjoy themselves more. So, I, you know, and I and like if you look at those six things, like you know, the industry ain't doing much to fix a lot of them. And and mm-hmm. and 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 I I know I always talk take this back to practice ownership just because it's something that I'm passionate about. Um, uh, you know, versus sort of you know corporate ownership model as the only option. You know, I think of all the things that can positively influence those six elements of burnout most um, significantly is practice ownership and and uh, you know it, it, you know if it, if it's done properly with good mentorship and coaching and so I you know that's why I, I, I really hope that in years to come the industry will uh, re-embrace practice ownership at a vet school level where vet schools talk about that being not only an option, but a really important option that should be considered at a higher level. And then helping the students with the skills they're going to need to success in practice ownership. I think currently that's missing. Yeah. And I think that there's, it's probably, do you think it's challenging for the students who, because they just don't see, you know, when I, when we interview a lot of people from a, on the podcast and we talk about diversity, what I hear a lot of people say are, are, are things like, it's hard for me to see me see myself in that role because I don't see anyone that looks like me. Right. And, yeah. and I would, I would say that's similar from a career path perspective. Right. So if you have new grads coming out and what they're seeing are a lot of consolidation, it's harder for them to see a path to become an individual practice owner when what they're seeing is consolidation, consolidation, consolidation. Right. And I think that exactly. speaks to what you're talking about. It, it is a bit. And I'll just tell people to watch Star Wars because remember the Rebel Alliance, everyone wrote them off <laughs> against the Federation and the Federation got a bit too cocky for themselves. Yep. And slowly but surely, <laughs> the Rebel Alliance come back. So if you like Star Wars, um, Love Star then, Wars. <laughs> uh, then get on that bandwagon because, you know, there, there's, hey, and, and as if I go back to what we started on, you know, what, and you might be seeing that and you see this consolidation and it is happening. It's happening actively. Right, but it, but it happened in the UK ten years ago as well, and it, and it sealed it it it, it plateaued out at about sixty percent consolidation, and and mm-hmm. in the UK the remaining forty percent of practices, many of them who are independent, realised that they had to practice smarter and more efficiently and often do so um, in communities or collaboratively with other hospitals and they were actually able to achieve a, a really fantastic alternative for, for veterinarians. And so, you, you know, um, be, be the change you want to happen. You know, if you're seeing right. this and you're seeing that in front of you, well, you know, we know that that model doesn't completely work because look at the stats on mental health and suicide. So it mm-hmm. might be happening, but it's not. I don't think it's it's a it's it it it, it creates a better world for veterinarians. In fact, you know, I'm very. Um, fiercely a fierce defender of vets having their seat at the table. And I think when mm-hmm. I arrived in America, I realized that vets are at the bottom of the food chain. You know, corporate businesses, online pharmacies, um, mm-hmm. you know, everyone was taking a slice of the industry and the vets are at the bottom and they've lost their seat at the table. And mm-hmm. the only way we can truly influence this industry to take care of us as professionals is to retake our seat at the table. And, and that involves veterinarians getting involved at leadership levels across the board, at, at local VMA, organized veterinary medicine. Um, you know, I need to do more there. I, I, I contribute where I can, but, um, you know, we need more young people involved. We need more people of color and, and, and minorities to get involved at, at, um, organized veterinary level, at the vet schools, um, podcasts. Um, Vin, you know, is, is a great great representer. Um, but, um, you know, we need to reverse this trend because, um, you know, corporate ownership of veterinary hospitals um, uh, is, um, in my opinion, contradictory 
to to um, to to vets having a seat at the table and really being the best voice for themselves and their patients and mm-hmm. most importantly themselves. Um, and right. and at the very least, there has to be a strong alternative. And if we don't do something about it, there is going to be a world where you know the majority of hospitals are, are under corporate ownership. And 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 if you look at the definition of burnout that that uh, um, you know is uh, presented uh, by Christina Maslax, you can see that it's very hard to avoid burnout in a corporate ownership model because a lot of the things Mm, that mm -hmm. are within that can't be achieved by veterinarian in a corporate ownership model. Um, You know, such as lack of control, value conflicts. You know, it, it's, mm-hmm. it's hard to have aligned values with candy companies and donut makers, if you know what I mean. I know exactly what you mean. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not that I don't like a, a candy from time to time. Or a donut. Not that you don't like a bag of M&Ms. Exactly. Um, I do love a donut. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I so appreciate you taking the time to talk with us, Andrew. And I know we, you know, we try to keep these under an hour just so that we increase audience listening. Oh, listening. of course. Yeah, yeah. No worries. <laughs> but but I do want to ask one more question, which I like to ask people at the end, which is, do you have a secret talent or something that you might enjoy doing that others might not know about? Secret talents. Um, well, my, my, my sister, Felicity, who's one of our super vets, has just walked in and I won't give her the microphone because she will... Um, uh, probably give you a lot of my uh, lesser lesser skill sets. Uh, I, well, I've got my uh, my my pilots and yachting, yachting licenses. Um, I, and, oh, uh, okay. So got, it. got that in. Yeah, that's how Paul Pion and I first connected. Was there you flying. go? Uh, yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> I love dancing and singing. I, I'm a karaoke amateur. Um, oh, I feel like that's a great answer. <laughs> yeah, that's probably my little unknown that that people don't know. I mean, p- people in Vin and other circles already know I'm an obsessed fly fisherman and mountain biker, hence the broken wrist. Um, but <laughs> I would say my sort of my little secrets probably, uh, you know, karaoke. I love getting up karaoke. there, good or bad, and having a crack. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a good one. That's a good one. <laughs> You, I never know what sort of answer I'm going to get. And sometimes I think I'm going to get one thing and then, you know, somebody says something totally different. So that's exactly, a great one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for taking the time, Andrew. I really, really appreciate it. I know you're extremely busy and I really applaud you for everything that you're doing in the profession and your willingness to fully show up here, not only listen to every single one of our episodes before doing so, you definitely get the gold star for being a guest that's engaged. Um, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. And I hopefully this is the beginning of many more, many more podcast episodes together. Oh, look, my great pleasure. It's just so such a great honor to be a part of it and contribute something and uh, I'm happy to help in any way. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Andrew. Bye. Okay. See you. Bye. Thank you for joining us for this episode of The Veterinary Pulse. Please check the episode notes for additional information referenced in the podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast, please follow, subscribe, and share review. We welcome feedback and hope you will tune in again. You can find out more about the VIN Foundation through our website, vinfoundation.org, and our social media channels. Thank you for being here. Be well.